Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to our series I Remember Umm al Banin alayhi salam. A series dedicated to remember Umm al Banin and what she stood up for, especially standing up for humility, her being the symbol of humility. And today we have with us, joining us, Sister Dua Maksumi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me. Sister Dua, what does it mean to, to be so how, how important is it to show humility, especially when facing hardships? Humility is uh, showing less importance of yourself and by being humble. Uh, and when you are arrogant, you are showing more Im importance of yourself by being arrogant. Uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam has some great quotes about uh, humility. One of them he says, Humility is the head of the mind and arrogance is the head of ignorance. So when you are facing hardship, ignorant people cannot help you whatsoever because they need help themselves because they're ignorant and they're showing arrogance. Uh, when you have the mind, you are more likely to offer help. You are more likely to help others when they're facing hardship in life. In another quote, Imam Ali salam says, Humility is a sign of nobleness, showing high, uh, high moral characteristic in yourself and in others, offering them help at any time. I'll give you an example to make it clear. Uh, one of them is, uh, say that there is one person who is rich, wealthy, and they're very humble about it. They don't brag about the money they have. They don't show importance of themselves because they're wealthy and rich. Uh, they're very humble about it. And at the same time, when they see someone who is in need of money, who has some financial problems, for example, a friend that wants to get married but does not have enough money to get married, and they are humble with their money, they tend to offer help. They will help them because they're humble with it. However, the one who's arrogant, who shows off, I am wealthy, I am rich, look at the house I have, the car I have, oh, I got this much money, they brag about their businesses. They're arrogant. What does that lead to them? Ignorance. They won't help. When they see a poor who's suffering from hunger, they won't help them because they'll just look at them, oh, look at that poor. And they just have so much importance in themselves. And that is why people with humility are more likely to help others who are facing problems. Um, and there are so many examples that we can bring upon. We can relate, definitely, definitely. And how can we aspire to Umm al Banin alayhi salam in terms of humility? How do we look up to her, learn from her? What did she present to us that shows a symbol of humility? Umm al Banin alayhi salam, uh, she was very humble to the orphans of Fatima al Zahra. Uh, she showed them humility in many different ways. Uh, she didn't want even her name to be said at home so that they won't remember their mother's name. Imagine that. Uh, she didn't enter as her being the stepmother. She wants to put rules and laws and she wants to rule the house. And uh, she took care of Ahl al-Bayt. She took care of Imam Hussein. When she first got married, Hassan and Hussein were sick on that night. And Umm al-Banin took care of them, she soothed them, she nurtured them, and she put them to bed. Imagine that. And one of Umm al-Banin salam's aspirations in life is to show each mother how she should learn, how each stepmother, how she should be with her stepsons. And it's very sad and disappointing that you hear about so many uh, stepmothers, how they treat their uh, stepsons or daughters. Uh, some of them torture them, some of them uh, bully them, they mistreat them, they yell at them. Unfortunately, uh, if the in-laws as well, we have many cases. Yeah, and one of Umm al-Banin salam's aspirations is to learn, is to show each stepmother how she should be. Yeah. Uh, it's very sad, especially when the father's not around, you tend to see those stepmothers, they bully and they be so rude and mean. And don't forget, even if that child 
doesn't listen to you because you're not his biological mother. Don't forget the pain and the sadness that's in their hearts. They're trying to uh, forget. By that way, this is how they react. They might not listen to you. They might be rude to you. Um, and every for every stepmother who is hearing this message, I tell her to go to read about the life of Umm al-Banin and how great of a stepmother she was. That is one of her aspirations in life. Uh, her role was to show every stepmother how she should be with her stepchildren. Treat them as you would treat your own children. Umm al-Banin treated Al-Hasan wal Hussein and Zainab salam, her stepchildren, better than she would treat her own children. She took care of them more because she knew that they are broken in the inside. They lost their mother. She tried to put that smile on their faces. She tried to replace the lo their loss. And that is one of Umm al-Banni salam's aspirations in life. And this is how she showed humility to them. She was very humble. She took care of them. She did not deny them anything uh, until she sacrificed her sons for, for Imam Hussein salam. Uh, she even used to tell uh, like her children how to respect their brothers from a different mother. Uh, instead of now where you see that so many stepmothers, uh, they make uh, segregations and they treat uh, her, her own sons different from the stepsons. And she makes that stepson feel like because she's not my mother, I've lost everything in my life. Uh, I am being bullied. I, my brothers are better than me. They have a mother. And no, that's not what Umm al-Banin uh, taught us. And that's not one of her aspirations. One of her aspirations is to show each stepmother how she should be with her stepsons. Indeed, indeed. And we have the f famous uh, story. So we know Umm al-Banin's name was uh, Fatwa, alayhi salam. And um, why was she called Umm al-Banin instead of Fatima? What was the reasoning behind that? Uh, behind that, Can you highlight upon that reason? Yeah, the reason behind that is because Fatima al-Zahra had the same name, the daughter of Rasulullah who was Imam Ali's first wife. So uh, the Al-Hasan wal Hussein, the orphans, and Zainab alayhi salam uh, knew their mother's name was Fatima and they would always hear that name in the house, O oh, Fatima. Umm al-Banin, was Imam Ali's last wife. So, awwalhum Fatima wa akhirhum Fatima. The first one Imam Ali married was named Fatima, and the last one, her name was Fatima. So, Umm al Banin did not want, look how sincere she was and how she showed humility. She did not brag about it and say, oh, my name should be Fatima, same thing as your mother's name. She showed humility to them, less importance. She wanted her name, her, her to she wanted to be called by a nickname, Umm al -Banin, in order for the two Imams uh, not to recall their mother's name and remember them. And in that case, you know, they will feel the pain, the sorrow, uh, the loss of their mother. They would remember their mother. Uh, Umm al -Banin showed humility to, to, uh, to Al-Hasan wal Hussein and Zainab uh, uh, in so many different ways. And again, not out of fame, not because she was the wife of Imam Ali yes. alayhi salam, or raising... Exactly. You know, and she came from a very well-known family. Yeah. Uh, Umm al-Banin, she was not someone far off the street who did not uh, be compatible to Amir al she, she Her father was known, her mother was known, her aunts were known, her ancestors, they were all known for their horsemanship, heroism, courage, and bravery. And she came from a nobleness family. So when she entered the house of Ali, she was compatible with Imam Ali alayhi salam due to the family she comes from, but she was very humble about it. She showed humility to them that you are better than me. Very interesting, actually. And uh, speaking about Umm al Banin and uh, how humble she was, and she came from a, um, a wealthy background, how, how was it that she adjusted uh, to her new life? I mean, I can imagine in this day and age, some, some youth or you know, newly, newlywed spouses would or the woman, either the woman or the or the man, they would kind of need find a compatible wealthy person or someone that could kind of reach that standard. How is it that Umm al-Banin, um, despite coming from a wealthy background, uh, adjust and accept the responsibilities that she was um, facing? What when examples? When Imam Ali alayhi salam he proposed to Umm al-Banin, a night before that, uh, she had a dream, and in her dream she saw that she was in a nice beautiful garden and she was looking at the sky the beauty she was amazed and she was looking at the moon 
and the moon fell in her lap along with three stars. Uh, so when Umm al-Banin was mentioning her dream to her mother, uh, Huzam went entered and he told her, your dream has just become true because Ali ibn Abi Talib has just proposed to you and if you marry her, you, if you marry him, you will uh, get a, a son who his face will be like the moon, Qamar Bani Hashim, which is Al Abbas alayhi salam, and three stars along. So you will have four sons. And Huzam, her father, asked her mother, how did you raise Umm al -Banin? Do you think she's suitable for us to give her for Ali? Do you think she would not embarrass us in front of Ali? Like he was even humble with the amazing daughter he had. He asked his wife, how did you raise her? Do you think that she would take this role? And Umm al-Bani knew from day one that she is marrying the leader, Imam. And she knew her responsibility that she has to take care of uh, his sons. She has to raise sons from Ali salam in order for them to be heroes, to be martyrs, in order for them to be great uh, characters in life. And she knew her position, she knew her mission, she knew her role because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave Fatima Zahra a role and she followed it. He gave Zainab alayhi salam a role and she followed it. He gave Imam Ali, all the Imams, all the infallible Imams had a role and their wives also had a role. Umm al Banin alayhi salam, she knew what her role was. Her, one of her roles was to be a great mother for the Imams. The, her second role was to be a great aspiration in life and to be a great mother to sacrifice her sons, to raise great sons like Al-Abbas and her other four son, three sons along. Indeed, SubhanAllah, what, what a lovely example and what a lovely way of kind of settling with your, in your new life. Is there anything you can relate to humility and maybe relate to this day and age, how we live by, what are the kind of, um, what are the examples we can use from Umm al humility with relation it's very important to show humility. Um, you have to uh, show less importance of yourself. For example, if you come from a well-known family with a great name, family of scholars, family who's respected, and you know that you come from this family, show humility to, to others. Don't wait for other people to come and greet you because you are the well-known family and you come from this part of family who's, who has the fame. Show uh, humility, talk to people, S you go greet them, don't wait for others to come and greet you. Um, for those who are wealthy out there and who hear me, I've seen a lot of wealthy people who just don't show their humility. On the other hand, there are some who are humble, but there are some who are very arrogant where they choose their friends, they make a group themselves, they choose the wealthy people and they look at other people as they are low class and them are high class which is totally wrong because there's no such thing as being high class and low class in Islam and in the eyes of Allah and uh, your money doesn't mean anything your wealth does not mean anything exactly. um, to us and to anybody and show humility help communities help the poor talk to everyone uh, one day if your money was to be taken away from you you are nothing so have faith in Allah uh, treat people nicely, show humility, and when you show humility to others, uh, you are not having low self-esteem in yourself. When you uh, greet people before they even greet you, that, that's not a sign of having low self-esteem in yourself. Because having low self-esteem is something totally different than being humble. Being humble is when you show less importance of yourself. When you know that you are a wealthy person, but you don't want to brag about it. You want to be with uh, other people that I am just the same thing as you. Just because of my money doesn't mean I'm something. Yeah. You, you be friends with everyone. You help people. You help communities. You help the poor. Um, you are humble about it. And having low self-esteem is totally different. Is when you are wealthy and you're just giving the money around to people because you want to be humble. That's not, that's not the meaning of being humble. That's, that is having a low self-esteem when you are wealthy and you go, okay, let me give my money out. People come and tell you, give me two million pounds and you're like, oh, sure, here, for no reason. No, that's having low self-esteem in yourself. That's an example. But by you being wealthy and you talk to everyone and you have very great friends who are not wealthy as you, but you do help them, you do help the poor, you do help communities, uh, you help orphans, that is you being humble. 
Um, so that is an example that we can learn. Another example, as I mentioned earlier, is when you are a, a famous person, you're known. You're known for maybe the family you come from, maybe from your experiences in life, what you work, what you do, what's your job, for you being a preacher, uh, anything else. Show humility to others. Don't act like, oh, you have to come greet me. I am somebody. I am this person. That's not humility. It really welcomes the other person, yes, doesn't it? Sometimes it does. When and you it makes you look at someone important. It's like, can I, go, can I approach this person? Yeah. Can I not? It's really uncomfortable for the other person. Exactly. So and imagine. that's why our scholars, the majority of them, or the really humble scholars, are the ones who you could visit, you could sit with, yeah. you could talk to. And when you enter, you're like, oh, I just saw the scholar in my eyes. Where there are some scholars that you can't enter, you can't see, no one could see them. Locked unless behind the scenes. Exactly. And you just see them on TV or you see their picture and you're just like, are they here? Are they alive? Uh, we just get news from them, but we don't see them. We don't see their daily lifestyle. We don't see how they greet people, how they talk. And there is a very great scholar who everyone gets to visit and everyone gets to see. And even children, they would come back, they'd be like, oh, I saw him. And they feel the the, his humbleness. Yeah, they do. And, and you learn a lot from that person as exactly. well. Sometimes when you're locked behind, um, for example, like locked behind the doors and you're not very out there and greeting people and showing yourself, then it's really hard to, sh to set a, a good example. Whereas when you're out there, it's... it's and that's how Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam were. You know, you could see Imam Ali, you could sit with him. You could see Zainab alayhi salam back in the days where she was a teacher. She used to teach Quran. Fatima Tazahra used to teach Quran. Fatima Tazahra used to give to the poor, help the poor. Umm al Banin was the same. They were humble. They showed humility to others. Um, where us today, we are nothing compared to them and we are arrogant. We show arrogance. Uh, and w which leads to ignorance, what Imam Ali alayhi salam said, where we just assume that we are something and we push people away, we act like we're bigger than people, we're, we're better than people. But when you show humility to others, it doesn't mean you have low self-esteem in yourself. Because you're a psychologist and you know, having low self-esteem in yourself is when you're insecure with yourself and insecure with others. Where you just don't trust others and you don't trust yourself and you think everything you do is wrong. But when you're humble, it's totally different. Doubting yourself constantly, yes indeed. So how do you believe one can reach this balance then? I know we spoke about self-esteem and we spoke about arrogance. Mm -hmm. It's quite hard to reach a balance, isn't there? Like a midpoint where, okay, I've got this money, yeah, um, and I can, I'm spending and I'm doing this to a certain extent. I have this money, there's uh, this other person you said um, that has so much money yet he doesn't do anything about it because he's got low self-esteem or he doesn't give, um, or he doesn't even maybe, maybe use his money wisely. How can someone reach this this balance kind of thing and be aware as well, not just, um, you know, someone, sometimes you can reach a part of a, a, a level of arrogance, but you don't even know it yourself, right? Or you can be so ignorant about it and ignoring, you know, society, your community, for example, or the needy or the poor, the homeless. Again, you don't know what is going on with your situation. How can, this, how can we reach this awareness? Um, one of our Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wa salam, they say, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يُحَاسِبْ نَفْسَهِ If you do not punish yourself every night, you are not from us, you are not from a follower. So it's very important as a Muslim, as a believer of Ahlul Bayt, of Allah, of the Prophet, is to always punish yourself at night, to sit with yourself and say, okay, I'm a millionaire here. What have I done to Allah and to, to Islam? And what have I done to myself? Okay, I've done to myself, I have nice beautiful cars outside. Um, I'm enjoying the money, I'm playing, I'm balling out there, you know, I'm enjoying my life. And at the same time, I just saw a poor out there who, who was asking, who was just saying hi to me, and I ignored them because I'm wealthy. And they're not my, in my the race. Yeah. Standards. Yeah. So go back to that poor and say hi to them. They just said hi. It doesn't mean when you're wealthy, someone says hi, that means they want money from you, right? Mm -hmm. So sit down and punish yourself. Know what good you've done and what good you haven't done. Yeah. And, and, and go back the next day and fix what you've done. For example, if you have fame in yourself and you are not humble about it, come back at home and be like, everyone likes me and respects me due to what the position I'm in and what I'm doing. But hey, I ignored a lot of other people. Let me go back the next day and say hi to them and greet them and be friends with them at least. At least give them a smile. Um, so to reach the stage of humility, you would have to understand the difference between low self-esteem is lowering yourself down 
and what the meaning humble means, humility. Uh, some people mix the meaning between them. They don't know what what self, low self-esteem is and showing humility does. So some people think that if they help people, uh, for example, pick up grocery, they're having low self-esteem in themselves. But when you offer help and you see like a lady or you see even a man who's struggling to pick up grocery and you're like, I would offer you some help. That's not having low self-esteem. It doesn't mean you're a maid. It doesn't mean that you are a slave being dragged. You offered help. But if someone comes up to you and says, hey, come here. Can you pick up my grocery and put, a, put them inside my house? That, if you would listen to them, then you are not having dignity in yourself, right? Because they're treating you as if you are their slave, their maid. You should listen to them at all times. So what you should do is tell them, excuse me. In my akhlaq, in my manners, I would help you if you would have said it in a nice way. And I could help you. So you show them your dignity. If you choose to help them, you can help them. If not, due to the disrespectful way they spoke to you. So we're not saying have low self-esteem in yourself, but be humble. You can tell them due to my manners, I'm going to help you. But next time, don't speak to me like that because I have dignity in myself and I'm a believer and I'm a mu'min. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says... Um, uh, the dignity of one is is much important than Rukm al Kaaba. And uh, we should all have dignity in ourselves. And we all do, alhamdulillah. But don't make it turn to arrogance. And don't be ignorant. Because when you're ignorant, Imam Ali solves it straight with his coat. When you show arrogance, you're ignorant. And when you show uh, hum humility, you are the one with the mind. And always have the mind. Know what's right and what's wrong. So when you know that this is wrong, say no. When you know it's right, say it's right. Because you have the mind. And you know when to be humble and when not to be humble. So say for example, you are wealthy. okay? And some every, everyone comes up to you and asks you to pay for this community. And you know that this community is not legit. And you know the money does not go to the poor. And you know that they're not using it enough. And you know, on the other hand, there is a community who is very humble and who really needs help. Help them. Don't just say, because this community and this um, uh, community does not use it wisely, I'm not going to give any communities at all. So if you are with the one with the mind, you know what to give and what not to give. And how to b strike the balance between being humble and uh, having low self-esteem. Indeed, and that's where reflection comes in, doesn't it? When yeah. Imam al-Mahdi himself says, may Allah, he's the his parents, those that do not reflect daily are not amongst me, so. Yeah, inshallah. So it's very important to reflect daily. Inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you very much, uh, You're Sister welcome. Dua. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave viewers, and inshallah, now up, we have the one-on-one -on -one coaching session with Sister Fahima Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Thank you for being here and welcome to the session. I understand that we're here today to talk about the loss of your children. So if you could firstly tell me what was it like for you um, losing your children to the emergence of Daesh? Life has never been easy for us. We had the time of Saddam and we overjoyed his fall. But life, la, Iraq has many issues. But Alhamad Dalila, we we um, I know it's a difficult time. Can't. But could you slightly explain as to the life that is right now, even through the trauma that you've been through? I can't even begin to explain. Life before was so perfect. We had our boys. Every morning they'd make a huge breakfast for us. And now that's no longer. Everything mm -hmm. was so perfect and 
then all of a sudden, our boys are no longer. My, me and my three boys would work at the bakery on our own. My wife would come down sometimes to help us, but I wish she wouldn't. <laughs> but it was really like we were a family business. There's no pain like losing your two sons. It's the most heart-wrenching pain I've ever been through. Every day I, I wake up hoping that they're still here. How does it make you feel knowing that your sons were eager to fight? They were so excited. They came in with, with tears in their eyes. And as a mother, I had to show joy for them. But deep down, you know, you, you don't want them to go. You want to keep them safe. And I wish that last hug when I hugged my sons. I just held them a little bit tighter. I wish I never let them go. I know it's tough to put yourself in those situations, but could you take me back to the time of when you were speaking to your sons, trying to show them support while having the feeling of fear, knowing what could happen? I tried to show them a brave face and show them how proud I was. And I always supported my boys and they were so hard working. I remember telling them that, you know, you can do this and I believe in you. And that I couldn't wait for the day when they came home safe and sound. So as a mother, how do you feel, or can you take me back to the time of the news when you heard that your sons were martyred? I can't even explain. I'm sure my heart stopped for a second. I had no words to explain how I was feeling. I kept telling myself it wasn't true and I tried to sleep and just pretend that I didn't hear the news and that it wasn't real. How long did it take you to actually process what had happened? I don't think I'll ever process the news. Even sitting here now, I still feel I'm gonna go home and see my boys. It was difficult for her, it was difficult. She, she, she tried to get over it, but it's so hard when you lost your own flesh and blood like that, you know? It's so as a father, how did the loss of your sons impact you? And especially, um, do you feel that you had to be strong for your wife, especially? Yes, uh, I did have to be strong for her. He's been there for me. He's, he's my rock. I mean, my boys used to be my rock, and as they're no longer here, I have my husband to thank. My world fell apart when I heard the news. But one look at her, and uh, I would keep it together. So you have strength between the two yes, of you yes, for each we other. Do. We do, yes. I we have to we have to be strong for each other. We love each other. We loved our sons. And other than each other, is there anyone else or anything else that you could tell me that gave you some strength and hope in this tragic situation? Al 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 Benin. Such a figure to look up to. The hope and the strength that I've got from Figure what she went through was just make just just it's a great role model and just it makes makes you think if she can do it then we could do it you know of course I've tried to implement everything into my life and try and have that hope and strength and 
if it wasn't for her, then I don't think I'd be here today. So we have the role model of Umm al -Bini to help you through this tragic moment, and you have each other. Is there anything else that you can sort of um, highlight as to the strength that keeps you going each day? She's my lifeline. Caring for her has helped me survive this. We've I'd say, even though my boy is no longer here, their duties and what they yeah. wanted, my boys are keeping me together. So overcoming this tragedy is not necessarily that you forget what happens, but it's more about trying to live through it every single day. And that's the most difficult time. So could you give me a, um, a detailed um, scenario of how this actually occurs in your house daily, overcoming this? Um, I, I try to pray every day um, and I try to use my strength and I rely a lot on my husband to pull me through every day. Um, my neighbours actually, they refer to me as the noble figure, um, which I always say to them, no one's as, as strong and as wise as her. She really is a figure that no one can, can be compared to. I can't even begin to explain how her strength and, and how she's inspired me. Mm -hmm. My husband is there for me every day, but Mel Bernin has been there for me. I try and, as I say, pray every day. And how do you remember your boys now? I still have their uniforms. I have their t-shirts. I loved my sons. They were so great. They were so talented and they went to go fight for their religion. They believed in their religion. They prayed every day. I never had an argument with them. When we went to the bakery, they worked hard. They did everything. Just to look at a photo of them now. I can't help but miss the photo. Just wish that they were here in the flesh. You have no idea the impact this has had on our lives. But we will try and get through it together. Yes, we will. And it's created even more strength between the two of you and family and community around you. Is that correct? Absolutely. If it wasn't for my husband, my friends, my family, my neighbourhood, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm not going to lie, every day is a struggle, but... That is true. That's true. Knowing that my boys are hopefully looking down on me. But anyone, if anyone goes through this, that doing what we're doing, basically supporting each other, yeah. still f believing in our faith. We don't blame anyone for what happened. These kind of things happen. My sons wanted to go to war. They asked my permission. I said, yes, you can go. And I was proud of them. They were, gr they were just, gr they were so wonderful. And that's an amazing statement that you've just mentioned. It's showing strength and faith even through this. And I think that's the best way to sort of end this session, to sort of remember that through tr tragedy, we have to hold on tight with family and most importantly, faith. And we have our role models to teach us that. And I just want to thank you for coming in today and speaking about this, even though it was so difficult. But I'm sure that you've helped, you know, so many people around you watching and learning and you've given inspiration and motivation that we can overcome this. And I only wish you more patience and inshallah, more happiness in your family and the strength between the two of you only increases. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart.
Thank you. It's a heartbreaking story, what an awful story that was, um, that was very hard to, to, to watch, it was really sad, despite, you know, losing three sons, I mean, how did, how did she do it, how did she cope, and despite that, she, you know, sent three children, but she moved on, she went and helped her, uh, her husband. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave each one of us tests. And her test was to lose all three of her sons. Um, and you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives someone a test, he sees what's the most important in, in the life of that person. So if the most important thing in my life is my son, you know, Allah is going to put a test for this. And if, if it's money, Allah will test me through this. If it's fame, Allah will test me through that. And uh, if it's your wealth and your health, Allah will test you through your health. Some people get sick and it's a test and it, he wants to see our reactions because most people say that I'm a believer, I'm a believer, I believe in Allah, I have faith in Allah. And, and Allah I, comes and says, okay. I'll test you, I'll test you in your health. Yeah. Uh, there was one man that, it, it was a story that's been mentioned uh, uh, where there is one man, he was very strong and he always comes to Quran and he talks about deen and one day he fell through an illness that had no cure for it and he started to tell people that I am a liar, I am a liar, no one believed me. They came to him and said, why are you saying that? He said, because Allah tests me in my health and I cannot handle this. I cannot handle the pain, I cannot handle the, the struggleness uh, that I'm going through. So Allah tested him in that. and he showed himself that he cannot handle, he cannot stand up for the faith that he had, the believing in Allah, and Allah, he's testing me, you know, amri la Allah, whatever, uh, if Allah chooses to cure me later on, um, alhamdulillah, if not, then I have to uh, move on in my life, uh, live with this illness until either I live or I die. So this particular lady, Allah tested her with the loss of three of her sons, and uh, imagine going back to the bakery, uh, that she's showing faith in Allah, that she moved on her daily life. Yes, she cried. Yes, she was depressed. Probably she lost her appetite for months and weeks or days. But at the same time, she went back and she said, they are martyrdoms and they went to Jannah. And we're not created for this world. Uh, you always refer to the hereafter, that they are martyrdoms and they have their position in, in paradise. And Allah has given them a great position. And at the same time, she was able, because she has faith in Allah, and uh, she moved on to her daily life. She went back to opening the bakery, even though her husband didn't want her to, to do this. But she, she had great faith, and uh, uh, I bow for this lady today uh, because I don't know, like me as a mother, I ask Allah to never uh, make me experience this because I don't know how I would react to this. Uh, losing three sons, like not one. Like if you ha if you lost one and you have another two, they will make you forget. Yeah, but all at once. And again, we remember Umm Al Banin because she's our great role model. We remember Zainab alayhi salam because she's our great model. Because say Zainab, she lost her whole family all at once. She lost her father, her grandfather, her mother, uh, even her unborn baby brother. She lost uh, all her brothers at once, her nephews, her nieces. And she still moved on in life and she had her mission that she had to complete. Um, and we remember them to, this is why we have the I Remember series, to always remember Ahl al-Bayt. Um, yes. Yeah, and I bow for this lady who lost uh, three of her sons all at once and she still moved on. But what makes such a lady move on is to always remember uh, why we're here in this world. It's like a mission. We complete it and we go. So she knew that their li life has stopped till this time and she has to continue without them until she knows that one day she will also follow them. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the love and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's, that's, our, that's our duty in this world, isn't it? Yes. To, to understand Him, to realize He exists, to um, believe in Him, to trust in Him. And that's showing, showing it through our actions, isn't yes. it? And at the end of the day, Allah says, um, 
you know I, I do not burden a, a soul more than it mm -hmm. can it can hold yes, yes. Yeah. and um, it's uh, something that Allah has uh, put into every human being that whatever the sufferings you're suffering from you one day you will pass by it you will forget um, like when you lose a loved one a brother a sister three sons you will cry you will mourn you will probably be insane but you would still move on into your lifestyle other than and even when you remember your sons after three years you would cry but the way that you would cry is not the same way you cried the first time you heard that they were martyrdoms other than Imam Hussein alayhi salam uh, Imam Hussein every year we remember him it's like the tragedy was yesterday it's like the tragedy was today and we would cry, we would remember the tragedy as if it just has happened. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave each and one of us as human beings this ability to move on and forget. And not to forget totally, but to forget the, the tragedy itself that has just happened uh, later on in the days is because it's nothing related to Imam Hussein He gave the most horrific pain that will never be removed for Imam Hussein and uh, alhamdulillah, we have people such as Ahlul Bayt, role models for us to remember, for us to um, always flash back on what has happened to them. And uh, when we remember like uh, what we lost, we always, uh, we, will, we will get sad and depressed, but at some point we will probably be able to talk about it. But when you remember Imam al Hussein, you would cry you would mourn as if he was just martyred, especially on the 10th day of Muharram. When you remember Umm al Banin and how she lost her four sons, you see people who are mourning and weeping and, and, and screaming and yelling as if it has just happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, special, special, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave things uh, special to Ahlul Bayt that he never gave to anyone else other than Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Peace and blessings be upon them. Thank you very much, Sister Ad. That was very insightful. May Allah bless you and bless welcome. and bless all the dear viewers. Um, dear viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, stay tuned. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.